stay right there in Psalm 127. And I actually want you to look, if you have your Bibles open, to look right under the title of the psalm. And you will notice a little phrase before verse 1 that says this, a song of degrees for Solomon. So a song of degrees or a psalm of ascent. And what this psalm was, was this psalm's about family. And it was sung by pilgrims as they journeyed to Jerusalem for one of the many annual required feasts. And so as they're ascending, as they're making their way up to the holy, up the holy hill to the holy tabernacle in Jerusalem, one of the songs that they're singing is a song all about family. And I think that that's important because Worship in many ways has to do with the family. We were already talking this morning about the fact that the family is the foundation of God's plan for man. And so it's extremely important that we understand that it's our role and our responsibility to pass on the ways of God and the knowledge of God to the next generation. And as they're getting ready to go up and worship, they're singing this psalm, which is all about family. So it's a psalm of ascent. It's a psalm of degrees. And it also says there that it's a song of degrees for Solomon. Now, although it sounds like this was a psalm that was written for Solomon, most scholars actually agree that it was a song that was written by Solomon. Because like Ecclesiastes, which is a very dark and depressing book, it shows the vanity and emptiness of living a life and especially trying to raise your family apart from God. Now, what I believe is sad, this psalm is an incredibly positive psalm. It's got a lot of hope. It shows you the big picture of what God intends for the family. I mean, it ought to light a fire under every single one of us. But what's so sad about this psalm is if it's written by Solomon, he never got to enjoy the benefits of what we're going to look at and what we're going to talk about today. Solomon's biggest disaster out of all of his disasters was his family. He completely failed. He had hundreds of wives and concubines. Who knows how many children he had? Dozens and dozens, hundreds, maybe a thousand children. I have no idea. But the Bible only records the name of one of his children, and his name was Rehoboam, and he was a complete disaster because under his leadership and rule, the kingdom was split and rent in two, and Solomon completely messed up when it comes to one of the most important things that life has to give you, and that is the family. The title of the message this morning and where we're going is this. It's a priceless investment. We're going to learn from this psalm that there is an investment that needs to be made into the family. Solomon messed up, and he was the complete opposite extreme of what you don't want to experience in life. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that I've had the privilege of being able to witness how true the big picture of Psalm 127 is. I want to say thank you to all of you that prayed for me last week. We were out of town on Monday. Um, We had the funeral for my grandmother, my Grammy. That's what we called her. She was the only person that was still allowed to call me Mikey, all right? No one else allowed to do that, but my grandmother called me Mikey, and that was the only thing she was ever going to call me. And she passed away at 91 years of age. She lived a long, wonderful, very fruitful life. Her and my grandfather, they were able to raise eight children, and uh, those eight children went on to produce 39 grandchildren, and on this past Monday at the funeral, I believe 34 out of the 39 of us grandchildren were all there, so we got a picture with the cousins, and uh, the only ones that didn't make it were like from Montana, and my brother Dan's in Madagascar. It's not too easy for him to come home for something like that, so um, pretty much everybody made an effort to be home and to be there for the funeral. One of the things that my grandparents excelled at was instilling in their children, my mom and dad, my aunts and uncles, the importance of family. Now, my family is far from perfect. If you know anything about the Brown side of the family and my aunts and uncles, they are um, very opinionated and they let you know what their opinions are. Anybody got families like that? Am I the only one? Okay. Um, They have no problem sharing their opinions with you. They got strong personalities. They have come to some very different conclusions about God. And in spite of all of the differences and all of that, they are still a very close family. And as a result, my grandmother was able to 
pass into eternity in one of the best ways that I believe possible. About four years ago, she started struggling with dementia and it became evident that she was gonna need round the clock care. So my aunts and uncles, my mom and dad, they all rearranged their schedules and for the past four years, they have taken turns going and caring for my grandmother. So for instance, my mom and dad would have every six weeks, they would leave on Sunday night and they would stay with my grandmother till Friday and they did this every six weeks for the past four years. Um, a, f- a few, maybe a, a year or so into that, about three years ago, she was on dialysis and she was going every day and she got sick and tired of it. She's like, I'm not going to live my life freezing to death in this cold room up here every day. I'm done. And the doctors are like, well, if you stop dialysis, you're only going to live for like three more months. And she said, I've had a long, wonderful life. That's okay. Well, she went on to defy the odds. She went on and lived another three years, not just three months. And the doctors were baffled. And the only conclusion that they could come to was she's living off love. Now, she did it about a year ago. My dad called us, all of, all of my siblings. And he's like, hey, your grandmother's getting close to passing away. And then she got better and she lived another year. And then about three weeks ago, he called again. And he's like, no, this time it's for real. She's sleeping like 23 hours a day. She's barely eating anything anymore. The doctors are thinking it's only days Well, she was Catholic. They called the priest in twice to read the last rites to her. So he showed up two different times. And then there was a Saturday where all the family was there because it was just literally hours before she's going to pass away. And she made it all the way till Tuesday. I mean, that's just how she did. She just defied the odds. And one of the reasons is her house, my entire life was like a revolving door of children and grandchildren and great grandchildren coming in and out. And even those last few days, it was like one person in, one person out. And I believe that my grandmother got to taste a little bit of heaven on earth through one of God's greatest gifts, the family. And she was able to leave this world in one of the best ways possible, being cared for by her children and being taken care of. I tell my mom and dad too, you know, the Bible says you reap what you sow. And I'm like, what does that mean for us as kids? Like, what do I need to be prepared for? If you took care of your mom for four years, we're in trouble, okay? So anyway, I just think it's an awesome, incredible gift when you stop and you look about it and you think about it. And Psalm 127, the big picture of what we're talking about here this morning is exactly that. The family is a priceless investment. It's important, and it's the wisest investment that you'll ever make. So let's just jump right into this. If you're gonna make a priceless investment into your family, you know what it begins with? It begins with the master planner. Look at verses one and two with me. Look at what the Bible says here in verse one. It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now, what you have to understand here is we are not talking about the physical structure, the physical structure of the house that you live in, unless the Lord build the house. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what the Lord is building inside of the house. We're talking about the home. We're talking about the family. We aren't talking about a physical city, but we're talking about a community. And what verse one says is, except the Lord build the house, the home. The family, except the Lord, build the community. They labor in vain that build it. They labor in vain that guard it. Now look at what he says in verse two. He says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. I think that verse two is an excellent description of so many people and parents Inside the United States of America, I think it is us. It is vain to rise up early. There are so many people that get up early and they stay up late and they're working and they're playing. And you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to cram every single thing that we possibly can into our lives. And when we don't get it all accomplished or we don't get to enjoy everything that we want to enjoy, we we go to bed and we feel stressed out or we just feel like something's missing and something's empty And you know what that verse says that is so powerful? It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late. And then what's that next line say? Everybody read it out loud. They put it up there. It says, it's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late. And then what's it say? To eat the bread of sorrows. To eat the bread of sorrows. Man, I think that there are so many parents in our world today that are worried about every single little thing. I talk to people all the time that can't sleep at night. 
and you're up at night and you're worried and you're stressed and you're trying to think about all these details that are honestly outside of your control. And you know what I do? I like to think about days and weeks ahead. I start, when I start thinking ahead about all the things that I got coming up and all the things that are going on, that's when I start getting really stressed. And you know what? It's vain for us to worry about things that are outside of our control that may or may not even happen. Man, I, I think of another thing that affects so many people. A lot of times we eat the, the bread of sorrows because of envy. I think social media can be a very dangerous thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. But how many times do you go to bed at night and you open up Instagram or Facebook and you start scrolling and then all of a sudden something just hits you in the wrong way and all of a sudden you can start realizing that other people have it better than I have it and you might start getting filled with envy when honestly, so much of that is a facade or so much of that is you're blessed too and we can't even see how good God's been in our lives. And I think of the bitter people that are, that are in our world that, that are stressed out for the wrongs that have been done to them or the losses that have happened and taken place in life. And you know what this verse says? It is vain to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. How many of you love sleep? Don't be going to sleep this morning, okay? I'll call you out. We don't need it right now. But sleep is a wonderful thing. How good can you be as a parent if you're stressed out to the max? You can't. If God's not the center of your family, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You want some good news this morning? God wants to build your house. Can I say that again? God wants to build your house. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is David. David built himself as king. He finally had some peace that came and he was able to build himself a huge mansion and he's living up in this nice big palace and he's got this desire in his heart. He's like, I'm living in this palace and God's dwelling in a tent. He's still in the tabernacle. I wanna build him a house. And God comes to David and says, guess what, David? You're not gonna build me a house. But guess what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to build your house. And one day there's going to be a son that comes who's going to sit on your throne forever. And he's going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I find that to be baffling. David had a desire to build God's house and to build God's name. And as a result, God comes to him and says, David, don't you worry about that. I'll take care of that. But I will build your house. Can I tell you, God wants to do the same thing for you and your home and your family? If we get that desire to lift high the name of Jesus, to use our home for his honor and for his glory, make no mistake about it. He will come and he will build your home and he will step in and do the things that you are not capable of doing in and of yourself. And so here's the first practical application. Let's go with God. Let's go with God. A priceless investment begins with the master planner. Let's go with God. This verse is not teaching let go and let God. That's a phrase that we say often. And there are certain things that sometimes we have to let go of. But in this instance, do you know that that verse is not saying, stop working, stop laboring? That's not what this verse says. Except It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. There's work that needs to be done. Every single day of our lives, they're shaping and cultivating and planting and all kinds of things that have to happen, but we don't need to do it in and of ourselves. We need to do it with God's help and with God's strength. Hey, there's all kinds of, I think of all these young families that are up here today. There's all kinds of important decisions you make, especially when you're just starting out in life, right? I mean, you got to decide what bank to go with. You got to choose a mortgage provider. You got to pick a realtor. You got to pick babysitters and schools and financial planners are really good and helpful. They're all important decisions, but they're all empty decisions unless you make the most important one out of all. Let's go with God. That's our number one priority. That's who we follow first and foremost above everything else. And guess what? When you go with God, your labor is not in vain. I was a few years ago at Christmas time, we had the opportunity to, we stayed in Atlanta on the way home and we got up on a Sunday morning. I found a church that was near the hotel as a Baptist church and it wasn't far down the street. So we go down the street a few miles. I thought it started at 1030, but apparently it started at 10. So here comes our family, not a very big church, probably less than a hundred people. And we walk in 30 minutes late into a service and we look around and we find out that we are the only white people in this entire church service. 
Now, I was like, I looked at my wife and I said, this is going to be awesome. I was fired up. And you know what? It was. It was amazing. And we sung this one song. I don't remember much about it, but it just went like this over and over again. Your labor. Your labor is not in vain. And it just kept repeating that over and over again. And the pastor came down and he's walking through and he's shaking people's hands and he's looking right at you and he's like, your labor is not in vain. And men that came up, the whole church made us feel welcome. I mean, it was awesome. At one point, Scarlett's standing there and while that song's going, her little booty was going too. I mean, <laughs> it was just, it was amazing. I tell you this story. It has left a lasting impression on me. I can't tell you the times when I'm out and my mind's going crazy and I'm stressing and I'm just getting worried about things and I'm reminded of that song over and over. That got stuck in my head. Your labor is not in vain. If you're with God, your labor is not in vain. He giveth his beloved sleep. Moms, I know there's probably many of you that woke up and your morning was far from perfect. You know why? It was up to your husband and kids to make it perfect. And quite frankly, we're not that great at it. And you might feel a little underappreciated this morning. You might not feel as loved as you are. There might be things that are unraveling. Can I tell you, if God is the center of your life and your world, he is going to move and work even if you don't see all the things that he's doing, your labor is not in vain. He giveth his beloved sleep. Go home tonight, close your eyes, trust God and let him do the things that you're not capable of doing in and of yourself. So a priceless investment begins with the right master planner. Secondly, a priceless investment requires the right capital. It requires the right capital. Does anybody want to guess what the capital is that is involved in a priceless investment? Anybody want to take a guess? Okay, none of you knew it. Guess what it is? It's children. Look at verse 3. And by the way, I heard just someone say, wow. And I think verse 3 even captures a little bit of the surprise of that. Because look at the very first word of chapter 3. I mean, of verse 3. What's it say? What's that first word? Lo, behold, see. Hey, pay attention to what I'm about to say. Children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are a heritage. They're an inheritance from the Lord. An inheritance is not fruit from your own labor. It's fruit from somebody else's labor that's passed down to you. What this verse is teaching is that children are God's gifts. What your house needs to be a home is children. What your city needs to be a community is children. Before I go any further, I do want to be very mindful and sensitive. I do understand that sometimes a day like Mother's Day brings up some extremely hard feelings in some people's lives. Unfortunately, we live in a sin-cursed, broken world, and not everybody's plans and dreams go the way that you think they're going to go. I'll just, I saw this last night right before I was going to bed. It was a mom that had posted on Facebook about, as like 13 or 14 years ago, she got up on Mother's Day morning and she was dreading going to church because of the desperate desire that she had to have a child. And then one year later, she showed up at church and she had triplet boys. And God had stepped in and had intervened and done a miracle. And her encouragement was, even if you don't see how, even if it feels impossible, God is working. And children are one of God's greatest gifts, but God gives a lot of really good gifts. And we just need to trust even in those areas. So I do want to say that before I move any further. I am sensitive of that, but I also don't want to ignore the truth of what we're talking about here and the vital importance. Children are God's gifts. So here's a practical application. See children as God's gifts. We live in a world that does not value children. In the worst sense, we live in a world that allows the lives of innocent unborn children to be taken in the name of a woman's right to choose. No, the Bible tells me that that child inside the womb is a life that is fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'm going to go to that in just a second. But even if we're not careful, when we talk about kids, sometimes we can talk about kids and the inconvenience that they are. Man, kids come in, they have a way of interrupting careers and they have a way of messing up financial plans sometimes. And uh, they have a way of causing a lot of gray hair to come onto your head and turning your life totally upside down. And if we're not careful, we can start focusing on the negative. But listen, anything in life that's worth having is worth what? Working for. 
Yeah, there's a lot of work that's involved, but there's not a greater work. There's not a more valuable work that we should be investing in than our children and our grandchildren. And by the way, every single, if the family is God's foundational plan for man, then all of us should be concerned and investing and interested in the next generation. Really, we all play a part in the family and helping families point their kids to Christ. See children as God's gifts. Man, Psalm 139 has some awesome things to say about the family, about children. David was talking and he said that, I, I don't have time for us to turn there, but he said, he tells us in Psalm 139 that God creates children and places them in the mother's womb. And they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Then he says something that's out astounding to me. He says that he has their life story written in a book before they ever even come into existence, before we even live one day on this earth, he already has our life story written into a book. And then he concludes that and he says, how precious are thy thoughts also unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Can I tell you that every soul, every life is precious to God. Every soul and every life is created in the very image and likeness of God. Every soul, every life, has the chance to grow up and magnify the truth, the worth, the greatness, the beauty of God. We cannot overestimate the importance that we have in shaping and steering our children towards God. Man, they have the opportunity to show this world who he is. Children are God's gift. So here's the second application to that though. If we're gonna have the right capital, you know what we need? We need to be a mighty parent. Look at verse four. Look at verse four, it says this, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. I brought an arrow with me today. You guys see my arrow? Okay, why are you all laughing? Because it's, guess what? Have you ever seen a stick fall out of a tree that looks like a perfectly shaped arrow that's ready to fly and do some damage? No, but especially back in the day before all of modern technology, arrows started off as sticks and they started off unshaped and unformed. And guess what? There was a lot of work, a lot of shaping that had to be done. And in the hand of a mighty man and a mighty archer, he can take a stick and with some work and some effort, all of a sudden it's produced an incredible weapon that can be used to hunt and to get meat and to provide for his family. Do you know that children come to us with distinct personality traits and individuality? Man, I get amazed. My wife and I talk about this all the time. We have four children. You want me to wave this stick around at everybody here this morning? I'll put it down. It could get crazy up here. <laughs> Four children who come from the same two people. Now they have a lot of similarities and probably as they get older, we'll realize that more and more. But I tell you what, they all four have these incredible, unique, different personalities. And we're like, the good ones came from her. <laughs> the ones that need some shaping and developing came from me. I'll take the blame for that. No, but listen, they, they come with all kinds of individuality and personality but in many ways, they come as a blank slate. They're given to you as a child. And the way that they're raised and the environment that they grow up in, and by the way, the gospel sets us free from everything. So you cannot look to your past and blame the past on who and why you are what you are today. Because the gospel and the transforming power of Jesus is enough to change every situation. But in large part... Man, how much better can we do for our children if we set them up for success by shaping them and nurturing them in the admonition of the Lord? Can I tell you this too? To make it even more difficult, they don't come with like some sort of operator's guide that says, this is what this particular unit was made for. And if you plug these buttons in, this is how they're gonna turn out. I mean, I got amazed. You know, you take your child home from the hospital and you start with the car seat. That's a really important thing. You gotta get that kid safe and buckled in. That, that car seat comes with like, 96 pages of instructions for how to like strap them in. And it's got all kinds of warnings and labels. And the nurse just takes the kid and is like, here you go, have fun. I'm like, what are we supposed to do with that? This is what we're supposed to do with that. God's given us an instruction manual. He's given us a book. And what we've got to do is we've got to watch. We've got to wait. We've got to learn. We've got to learn how to guide them to God's word, through God's word, to the destiny that he has for them. Man, a parent in tune with God can take a stick like this and turn it into a fine arrow and able to launch it out into the world where that child can have a true impact and make a real difference for God in this world. But if that's going to happen, 
parents, we've got to be mighty and skillful. We've got to be mighty and skillful. What is it that we've got to be mighty and skillful in? We've got to be mighty and skillful in in having a desire, a hunger and thirst to have a relationship with God. We've got to be mighty and skillful in knowing this book and knowing this manual. I'll never forget when Stuart was born, we had a book. It was called What to Expect in the First Year. And every little thing that he did, I remember, like, if he breathed weird, I was like, that breathing sounds weird. And I'd open it up one month. Oh, that's perfectly normal. I mean, it put me at ease. I mean, I used that book as like a reference and a manual, and it got me through the first year. Can I tell you what? If we had that same type of desperation for God's word, We got to be mighty and skillful in the truths and the promises of this book. And when our kids come to us and they're struggling or they're asking questions, we ought to give them not just our opinion. We ought to give them God's word and we ought to point them to Christ. Hey, we ought to be parents that are mighty and skillful at getting into the presence of God, that get on our knees when we're desperate, when things are beyond our control, when it feels like we don't have the answers. I know who does, God does. And I know who has the power to turn any situation upside down and put it back on on track and that's him God give us parents that are mighty and getting on our face before God and asking for his wisdom and for his strength and living inside of God's word and staying laser focused on what's important and what matters and that book has every answer that we need so yes a priceless investment requires the right capital and last but not least the priceless investment results in blessings look at verse 5 It says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. You know what that verse is saying? Happy is a man that has a lot of children. My dad has 10 kids. He contributed 10 out of the 39 grandkids. My dad's a little bit crazy, I think, sometimes, but he is a happy man. The other day, my brother Dave and I were in the car with him. My sister Michelle calls him up. And he says, Shao, how in the world are you? That's how he answers the phone all the time. And Michelle's like, I'm good, Dad, how are you? And he says, I am wonderful. I am full of wonder. And Dave and I are in the back like, wow, this is a lot right now going on. And we're picking on him because he's easy to do that with. You can pick on him. And we're like, full of wonder. Okay, that's amazing. <laughs> do you know the reality? was this, is, this was on one of the hardest days of your entire life, the day that you said goodbye to your mom. But he was full of wonder. There was nothing fake, nothing put on about, nothing frivolous about that. He was filled with the goodness of God because he was surrounded by nine out of his 10 children. And he was rejoicing in the life that God had blessed him with through his mom and, and the years that they had together. I'm telling you, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of him. Here's a simple application. Don't worry, be happy. There you go. Y'all know, how many know that? I'm not gonna sing it for you, but don't worry. Be happy. There's a great principle in here. Have kids and have a lot of them. I'm not getting a big amen to that one right there. I mean, my dad says multiplication doesn't start till at least two times two. So he thinks four is a minimum. I'm like, dad, 10 is a lot. But there's a good principle here. Children are God's gifts. I think sometimes we have to maybe be open to changing the way that we think about children and even potentially how many that God gives us and how many that we have. Hey, have a lot of children. Here's many children make many prayers. How many of you can agree with that and say amen to that? Many prayers make many blessings. Many children make many. Hey, those times you're on your knees crying out to God to intervene and help, you know what those are going to result in? Those are going to result in answered prayers. Whether God's changing and transforming you, whether God's changing and transforming the situation. Many children make many prayers and many prayers bring many blessings. Here's another thing from this verse. Results in blessings. Expect great things. Look at how that verse ends. It says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. It says, they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. This is an awesome word picture. The idea here is that as Christian parents who allow God to build their house. We go with God, and as he builds our house, we're able to raise children that end up in positions of influence or prominence, especially when it comes to defending the city. Now, what are we talking about defending? We're we're talking about defending the truth of God's word. Hey, you know what would be awesome? 
If we raise children who knew this book and were willing to go out into this world and to take a stand for the truth of what God's word says, it's our responsibility to pass on to the next generation the ways and the truth of God. It's their responsibility. It's our responsibility as believers to go out into this world and to let our light shine, to be the conscience of the state. We just talked about that in Romans chapter 13 a few weeks ago. Our job is to raise children who will first and foremost stand in the defense and confirmation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and be unashamed to let this world know that I'm a follower of God and every blessing and every good thing that I have in life comes from God and comes from him above. You know that phrase, what we do in moderation, our children will do in excess. How many of you think of that phrase in a negative sense? I've heard that my whole life in a negative sense, but what if it were true? What if what we did in moderation, what if what we did in moderation, even as parents that strive to be mighty parents of God, our children ended up going out into this world and doing in excess? What a blessing and privilege that it would be. How do you close a message like this? I got a dad joke for you. I know it's Mother's Day. (laughs) But um, years ago, we were at my mom and dad's house. A bunch of people were swimming in the above ground pool. I mean, there's a bee flying around and everybody, like the little kids are like, there's a bee, there's a bee, there's a bee. And my dad, nice, cool, calm and collected, he says, just let it be. (laughs) That's genius right there. I love that one right there. (laughs) Just let it be. Here's how I want to close our service this morning. Not just let it be, but just be. We got some honey up here today. We got a little bee charm on this honey, on the gift that you're going to take with you. You know that honey is actually an absolutely incredible gift from God? Man, there's a lot of cool things about honey that I think point to the moms that are represented here today. One of them is just honey stands the test of time. If we were to go back 500 years, 1,000 years in history, and we were to sit down at a table and eat breakfast with somebody, we might be grossed out by the food that they have. They might wonder what our white flour looks like that's been bleached and different things like that. But you know what's going to be on that table that we can all go to that we'll have in common? Honey. Honey stands the test of time, just like mothers stand the test of time. You've been the backbone of society and the backbone of families for years and years and years. And moms make a huge difference. You know what else? Honey is unprocessed. It doesn't need a lot of preservatives and sugars. It really doesn't need any, and it can last for forever. And I think of you moms that are here today, and you know what? You are exactly who God made you to be for your children and for your homes and for your families. And a lot of times I know you look out and you think, man, if I just had this skill or this ability, and we start thinking about the things that we don't have, you know you are exactly who God made for the children that he's given to you. And all you need is him to step in and enable you to do what you think you're not capable of doing. You know that honey in the Bible is represented with the promised land. He was going to send them into a land that floweth with milk and, man, it's, it's a symbol of God's gifts in life. Well, how do we get that honey? We get honey from a bee. I think about bees. I, I have just been reading a little bit about this process, and it's absolutely incredible. You know that a bee forages, he flies around, he goes and finds a flower and he digs into that flower and he gets the nectar and then he takes the nectar nectar, and he flies back to the hive or wherever it is and while he's flying back, he's starting to digest it. When he gets back to the hive, he does a little bee dance. Did any of you know about the little bee dance that happens? He like communicates, he doesn't talk but he communicates. Yeah, right there, Brock, he could tell us all about it. They do this little bee dance that tells like the other bees where he got the honey from, got the nectar from, it's not honey. And then they fly off and then he goes into the hive with uh, the nectar that he has that's been digesting. And for the next 20 minutes or so, that nectar gets passed around from bee to bee to bee to bee until it's digested. And then when it's digested, they take it and they put it into one of the cells of the honeycomb. Now in there, they have to gradually increase the sugar level. Okay, so that way it won't get to the point where it will ferment and that it will be able to last. So in order to do that, you know what they do? They use their body heat. And so they're buzzing around and they're flying. You ever heard that phrase, busy as a bee? Man, they're flying around and they're flapping their rings and their heat is like warming up that... um, that nectar or whatever it is at that point, and it's removing the water, it's evaporating the water, and their wings that are flapping around are circulating the air that it's done. And when it gets to just the right level, it's exactly what it needs to be to be honey. They put wax on top of that cell, and they move on to the next one, and they repeat the process all over again. 
So you know what that means to get honey, which by the way, I don't even know if bees know what they're doing and what they're producing, this gift that has stood the test of time. They're just flying around doing exactly what God told them to do. They're just being who God created them to be. And they're giving us one of God's greatest gifts, honey. You know what it takes to get that honey? It takes foraging. It takes dancing. It takes digesting. It takes flying. It takes buzzing. It takes movement, energy, all kinds of crazy stuff that goes in to producing the fruit. And I think this is a perfect analogy of what Psalm 127 is talking about. If we're going to raise and produce children that are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man that get launched into this world that make a difference, there's going to be a whole lot of work involved. And I say a big thank you and a hearty amen to every mom in here that I get amazed at how you can juggle 96 million things at one time when I can only do one thing at one time. I can't even listen to what you're saying while I'm sending a text, okay? So if you ever see me with my head down, I don't hear a word that you're saying. But somehow you ladies are able to balance all of it. You hear everything that we're saying, you make up a lot of things we did. Oh, I didn't say that. No, just kidding. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying here this morning? It's, it's absolutely incredible what you're able to do. But one last reminder in all of that, we can get so stressed out and focused on the work that we forget to just be. Just be in the presence of God. When you get ready to go to bed at night, as long as you can lay down with a clear conscience before God, put it in his hands. He's got it under control. Just be a parent that gets up every day and gets into God's word and humbles yourself before God and says, God, I need your hope and I need your strength. I can't do this. I just need to be who you created me to be. That's it. That's all God wants you to do. He just wants you to be you. He just wants you to get into his word. He just wants you to trust him to transform and change and develop you into the woman, into the man, into the person that God wants you to be. And if we could just rest in his presence, make no mistake about it, he will be working and producing something far greater than we could ever possibly imagine. If we just be.